I think everybody is here that I know of. Let's begin. Let's stand and have a prayer and a pledge of allegiance. Heavenly Father, we gather today to handle county business, and we are grateful that you have placed us in these positions of responsibility, each person in this room, uh, regardless of what capacity they are in. And we just pray that you would guide us through each agenda item, that you would lead us to make the appropriate decision on each. Uh, we ask that for this meeting, for all future meetings, as we wrap up budget at this time of the year and set the tax rate. Father, we turn the agenda over to you and ask that you just steer us through this. Uh, be with our uh, first responders, wherever they may be, whatever they may be working on today or this week, and continue to protect them, as well as our servicemen and women uh, around the globe. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Welcome everyone to our first meeting of the month of September 2019. Today is the 10th and we're holding court on a Tuesday because of uh, some conflicts yesterday and an opportunity for some training on a new piece of road equipment and I understand that training went well so it sounds like the delay was worth it. But anyway, we gather today on Tuesday, September 10th, 2019, just after 9 o'clock. We'll begin item 1, our time for public comments or requests for information on non-agenda items, if there is anyone here from the public or otherwise. Ms. Janice, you have anything today? Looks like you represent the public today. I'm the You're the public. I'm They're, pay they're paying the rest of us. You're the only one here representing the public. If not, we'll move on to item number two, considering possibly approved minutes from our August 26th meeting. That was our second meeting in the month of August. Make a motion we approve the minutes. Motion for approval of that set of minutes is made by Commissioner Parker. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Fitch. All in favor say aye. Aye. Item number three, considering possibly approve a resolution for our 2019 tax office exemptions and discounts. I don't think there's any changes to this this year, is there, Judy? Uh, these are the ones that we typically handle each year, but nonetheless, let me read over these, at least summarize this. This is where we set the discounts that are available to taxpayers. So, be it resolved to allow a discount to the property owners of Titus County for the early payment of county property taxes for the 2019 year in accordance with Section 3105 of the Property Code. That rate will be a 3% discount if they pay it in the month of October 2019, 2% discount if paid by the end of November, and 1% if paid by the end of December. And then, of course, the full amount is due by January 31. Also, uh, to allow a 20% exemption on the value of homesteads in Titus County for the purpose of property tax in accordance with Section 11.13, but not less than $5,000. Also resolved that uh, the property code permits an exemption of an additional amount on all homesteads by persons 65 years of age or older in determining the amount of property tax due, and this amount has been $15,000. And be it resolved that persons under 65 who are 100% disabled, according to Social Security, is here, are hereby granted an additional exemption of $10,000 on their homestead. And be it resolved that the property tax code permits a governing body to adopt a tax rate for persons 65 years of age or older on their homestead in accordance with Section 11.261. And today, being the 10th of December, uh, this is here for our signature and approval, should you s choose to do so. It's the 10th of September. What's that? You said December. I thought I said September. De September is what I meant, regardless of what I'm, I'm hoping for that cold weather. 
10th of September 2019. So you've got the discounts according to early payment. You've got the standard home exemption. You've got a 65-year-old and uh, up exemption and you've got a disability exemption and then you've got the tax freeze for persons 65 years of age or older. Brian, I was I was asked a question the other day <clears throat> about uh, the 65 and up exemption if it automatically went in or if you had to contact the appraisal district. And I told them I wasn't for certain uh, how that worked. So you, does anybody Okay. I, I was thinking that's what it was, but I wasn't for sure. So, at what point is your age measured? On the first of the year, end of the year, what? The year that you turn 65. Will it be that whole year? Is it retroactive to the first of that year? So, December 31st birthday gets uh, the benefits that entire year. Okay. All right, but you do need to go to the appraisal district and make sure they know your birth date and make sure you're registered for that in order to receive it. Okay. That makes sense. Any Can other make, questions, comments, concerns? I make a motion we approve. Motion is made to approve this resolution uh, granting these special handlings of tax payments for the year 2019. Motion is made by Commissioner Parker. Second. Second. By Commissioner Applewhite, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, I will pass you this resolution for your signatures while I continue. Item number four, consider and possibly enter into an interlocal contract with the Texas Department of Information Resources regarding an election security assessment. And you've received about 200 pages from Pam Holmes, I think, for you to read. And if you all understand it, I'll let you explain this. But we're hoping that Pam can bring some, uh, some kind of an explanation to us and, and tell us what's going on here. Why is this being done? These are my questions. Why is it being done? Is it mandatory? Is it beneficial? Um, and what's it going to cost? Okay, well, I did send out a lot of information on this because I've done several hours of research with the Secretary of State's office. And um, if you don't mind, I'd like to pass out some more pages of information. <laughs> Is this different what you sent us already? Treat the golden no, car. It's just got the highlighted areas uh, for your consideration. And maybe you have your own areas highlighted that you want to question. So it is a, an election security assessment that we I'm asking you to consider uh, entering into a contract with to have it performed. Um, this first email on the top of this packet that I just gave you is one that I received back in March and uh, I was just getting my feet wet at that time and it was uh, not something that was placed high on my priority list nor on Mr. Rockwell's. And so um, we, after this came about, so this, at this point, this is dated March 15th, the um, assessment is still optional, okay? And it gives a real good overview of what is expected of the county and what is involved in the assessment. So it's from the Secretary of State, partnered with the Texas Department of Information Resources, or the DIR, and that's the uh, department that with whom would be signing the contract if we do this. Is that that's not a new entity? That's no. Been around. Mm -hmm. That's that's correct. And then DIR has contracted with AT and T as its vendor. So you find that right there in that email in the first paragraph. Um, to participate in the project, we have to we have these several. Um, components that we have to do. The interlocal contract is the first step to getting actually getting onboarded with the project 
And so that would be between the county and DIR, and that requires a signature, and so that's uh, part of what I'm here for today. And then the solutions proposal package, and that's been pre-negotiated by the DIR with the SOS and AT&T, and changes cannot be made to that at this time. So um, they are wanting us to have the project approved by Commissioner's Court, um, so that's what I'm here for today. Then on the second page, uh, they were wanting the Commissioner's Court to be advised of the following. The county will not be invoiced, so there is no cost to the county for this uh, service. And the reason why the county will not be invoiced is because federal funds have been made available to the state of Texas, and the state of Ta Texas is making those funds available to us through the um, Help Americans Vote Act. So we have funds to actually do the assessment and then if needed remediation afterwards um, so we need to have a single point of contact which that would be me and um, so it does say it would also be beneficial for the single point of contact to have some decision making and signature authority um, i'm going to leave that up to y'all's discretion because there will be other things coming down the line, you know, and if we have to delay two weeks to bring it to commissioner's court, I'm not sure we would meet our December 31st deadline, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so it all gets, the county gets onboarded about five days after returning the signed ILC, the contract. And uh, since the SPP template attached to this email would be the same, less uh, the county name. Our hope is that it will be sufficient for the commissioner's court to sign off on and give the, the single point of contact the authority to official approve it once the county's been onboarded. And we, that doesn't happen until after the contract. And then uh, it gives some areas that will be reviewed. And as far as I can tell, that is everything that concerns the elections office. Um, and then what we can expect in return is an assessment scorecard and assessment report. And I don't really expect that we would get a glowing report at this time, but the whole purpose of an audit, like in the banking world, world is that you see your mistakes and you correct them. So I, it's going to be a learning process. Like I said, um, at this time in March, it was not mandatory. It was only strongly rec recommended. Where do you see the verbiage that says it is now mandatory? Okay, if you would go on to the next email, and this one is dated August 12th of this year. This is from Christina Atkins, the legal director of the elections division at the office of the Texas Secretary of State. And she says in this email, she actually gives links to House Bill 1421 and then also the elections advisory that was sent out. And I have that for your consideration as well. But anyway, point number one, she says that a county election officer must request an assessment and then it is required that each county receive one. So that's where I'm getting the verbiage that it's mandatory, but also we can see it in the um, bill that was passed by the House. Um, and then it goes on and tells us that Gene Moore from AT&T is the contact, and he will gather the required information and send it over to DIR, and then we'll be uh, connected with this shared services contract with the DIR and while they offer um, other IT services we'll not be utilizing them we're only contracting with the DIR for the uh, security assessment so then the next page is the actual law the House Bill 1421 and there under section B of section 279.002, it says, a county election officer shall request an assessment of the cybersecurity of the county's election system 
from a provider of cybersecurity assessments if the Secretary of State recommends an assessment and the necessary funds are available. Well, the Secretary of State has recommended it and the necessary funds are available. But it doesn't give a date as to when it must occur that I see. Um, that was in the... In the elections advisory, which is the last thing in your packet, page number two. In that highlighted area, it is in bold. It says all paperwork associated with initiating the county ESA must be completed by December 31st. <clears throat> and then at that very last red underlined statement says that House Bill 1421 makes these assessments mandatory for all counties. Yes. Well, I don't like everybody. I don't like the idea of us giving them access to our records. This DIR, or this company that owned by AT&T or whoever. I don't think that's a good idea, and it says we can we can provide our own cyber security, and, and it's not mandatory to take this one. This is state run. How do how do we know who's who's uh, who's getting this information? A bunch of Democrats may get it and change this data. They can I access. <laughs> so anyway, but they have access. It says in that agreement that you open up windows to your system and they can sit down in Austin and pick on it all they want to. I think that we should have our own cyber security somehow. We have, a, we have, we have some, <clears throat> a little bit now, but maybe we should, we, I, I th I'd rather get our own. We don't know who they're going to hire. They might be hiring, uh, you know, a bunch of Republicans to do it or whatever. You know what I mean? Yes. We don't know. And there'd be a, a person in there with a with a bad attitude. They'd be making some, a lot of changes in data down in Austin. They're very liberal down there. So don't tell them what to do. <clears throat> I don't think we ought to sign. I think we ought to look for a different contract, not sign up with this state contract for our security. Uh, do you opinion. mind if I address that? Uh, the, um, for one thing, this is not going to cost the county a penny. If we do our own assessment with a third party vendor. And then, I mean, I feel comfortable having the state's backing on the vendors that they've chosen. And uh, they've chosen DIR, and DIR is contracted with AT&T. And they've already set in place the contracts for that. Um, so we do know who the vendors are as far as that. The cost is one thing. And then secondly, I'd like to address um, our data is, our elections data is not um, connected to the internet. It's not what? Our elections data is not connected to the internet. Our counting facilities and um, when we receive in the votes at the end of an election, it's not connected to the internet in any way. The only thing that we do that's on the internet is um, we have the voter registration information that um, is on the, the team's website. And so that's what we use. It's a, it's a service that the uh, state of Texas provides for us. It says here, uh that if an if election officer requests an assessment of the county's election system from a, from a provider, the state recommends an ass assessment and necessary funds are available on this page uh, number two of uh, one. So that would be paid for if we had our own uh, se security. Uh, well, I'm not sure about that, Commissioner Riddle, but we can sure contact the Secretary of State's office and find out. I've been in contact with the Secretary of State's office in, um, for several pieces of correspondence and I've been looking into this for several hours of research 
And I feel very comfortable with this. Um, is this going on during our November election? I don't know when they would um, want to come in and actually do that. They would set a, we would mutually agree on a date that they would come in and actually do the assessment. So no, I would not have them do it during the November election. Do you know if any counties have already had this completed? Uh, Red River has. Have you had any conversation with them as to how that went? Was it no, a good I thing? Have, I have not. Um, I mean, that's just the one, the one that I know of that borders our county. And um, I think that Gene Moore actually stopped by my office one day to have a conversation with me. And he's the representative from AT&T. And um, he had been coming over from Cass County that day, so they were getting their ball rolling. What does AT&T know about election process? That, that just seems like a strange company to pick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, it, in the IT world, I understand that you don't call it audits. I'm from the banking world, and you call it audits. But um, they have the, uh, the IT know-how to do the assessment. But is this really an audit of IT functions, or is it an audit of our unique county elections procedures? Yes, it, it is. Um, it's an audit of our total package here, as far as I understand. Mm -hmm. the the AT&T would be the information gathering service, and then DIR is the one that actually gives us the score. Well, understood. It's just our security. And we're we're required to get our security check. Or yes, but, somebody to certify mm -hmm. we're doing it. Or, but security encompasses a whole lot of different aspects of our office uh, procedures, from how we store our machines to how we're getting the data from the polling place into the elections office for counting at night. So there's it encompasses a lot of different areas. I guess AT&T has formed this company, DIR, to do this. It's going to be a division of AT&T. No, DIR, DIR is, a, is a state entity. It's a state. It is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and it's mm -hmm. been around prior to ever coming up with this idea. Yes. And bottom line, you believe it's mandatory. We don't have an option. It's paid for. And you feel like even though somebody's going to be taking up your time and criticizing your standards and, and how you do, do things, you feel like you'll benefit from the information gained from this audit. I absolutely to believe so, yes. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Al, you've obviously thought about this, and, and I'm interested in your comments. Where do you think we might could possibly be vulnerable? Uh, the, uh, according to the way I read that, they can access everything we've had, and they'll have to, to to judge us whether we're secure or not, I suppose. So we have to give them access. They can tune in anytime they want to, look at any data we have. We don't have any we should be allowed to give them the data they ask for. Well, what do we have that's available online that they would have access to? We don't have anything available online except for the voter registration information, and that information and that's is... always been available And online. that's public information. Well, why do they want access to all these other things? To, to assess our, our security. But the agreement says that we have to sign where they can access it any time they get ready. Uh, I don't, uh, and I don't know for what reason they might, but they might have a reason for it. Uh, but that, uh, for us to just have an open book for someone, and we don't know who their employees are, who they're going to hire, they may hire from census takers. I don't know. Well, you know and we that, wouldn't know that of any third party vendor if we, well, you know, if we yeah, chose Yeah, we could. If we knew the third party, we might have a little closer 
association with them than that we would uh, AT&T. Well, the third party is the DIR. Yeah, okay. I don't know, it just seems kind of shaky. I, don't, I, I just hate people can access our data. We, we need to be able to send them what they ask for, not just let them do it at willy-nilly whenever they want to. But that's just because I'm old, probably. <laughs> I understand your concerns, Commissioner, and um, I understand that uh, I don't think there's anybody in this room that wants to see anything but the best for Titus County. Well, you know a whole lot more about your job than I'm ever going to know. If you believe that this is a good thing and you're comfortable with it and you feel like you'll come out with a stronger office, uh, I'll support this. Okay, thank you. Do you have any reservations at all about it? Does anything concern you? No, not after my very thorough research on it. Just as a suggestion, regardless of how we vote today, you might give Red River a call and just say, hey, how did, yes, how did it go? That's something that I should have done if before they say, today. oh my gosh, this was an absolute disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just find it hard to believe all 254 <clears throat> counties are going to say, yep, sign me up. I'm ready to go. <laughs> when you've got little small counties that barely have anybody that's in the elections office, you know, we're mm -hmm. blessed to have an elections administrator. Mm -hmm wonder how they're going to do it. Commissioners, any of you others have questions or comments for Pam? Mm -hmm. She needs an answer. Appreciate you being willing to subject yourself to this. Not, none of us like to be audited. <laughs> Commissioners, we need a no or a yes or a motion or something. I'd like to table it and learn more about it uh, than I know now. Got a motion on the floor to table this. Second. Second by uh, Commissioner Applewhite. All in favor of tabling, say aye. Aye. Uh, uh, uh. No. What is that, four, one? All right. Uh, every time we delay this, it does what to you or to the process, do you know? Okay, as, as I will discuss later in this meeting, we're going to have a meeting next Monday, a week from, from yesterday, six days from now, for a tax rate hearing. Could I tack this on again? Do you think you all could be ready in six days to make a decision? Yeah, check with Red River County and see what they say, too. be interested in what they have to say about it. Okay, I'll plan. Carolyn will help me remember to put on next Monday's 9 a.m. agenda after our tax rate hearing, we'll put this same agenda item uh, up for a vote again. Okay? All right, we've got uh, a four commissioner vote to table this item. Okay, let's uh, move on to item number five and see what you've been working on uh, regarding roads. I'll start to my left, Commissioner Precinct 4. <coughs> we uh, started off, as the judge said earlier, we uh, had a school yesterday on our new distributor truck out on County Road 3155. We're uh, putting some stabilizer in, in that road. and. Uh, everything went real well yesterday. We had representatives from all four precincts out there to kind of 
gathers the information and, and all that we could get from, from the guy from, uh, uh, and if yesterday was the only day that he could be there. So uh, that's one reason that we tried to, I mean, put it off until what, then. What did you distribute uh, with the new truck yesterday? We uh, put out stabili a stabilizer in the road. Uh, is that that product you went to Waco to get? No, they brought no. it here. They brought but it it's in, that in same product. It's, it's, it's that product. Different, different product. Yeah. This, this is a, a, a process pre pre that precedes the seal coating that, that hopefully makes your base harder before this, you seal This road it. has got a lot of sugar sand in it. We've had a lot of trouble. We've hauled load after load of, of reclaim and flex base out of the, you know, from the power plant and all to try to get this base hardened up. And this was a, a product that, that I found actually at, at school last year. And uh, it, along with the, this road overcoat that, we're, we will, that I'm going to use some of this fall, um, that, that they only make it through the, the fall part of the year. And uh, it really worked. We done, done about half the road yesterday. It's about a mile long, and, and we done about half of it yesterday. Got back over this morning, and where the uh, sheep foot packer was running over it, making ruts or places in it two or three inches deep yesterday, he drove over it this morning, and you couldn't even see where he drove over it. It's so pretty hard. It, it's real hard. Set up overnight that way. Uh, it and it to to completely cure it takes 72 hours. So it's going to get even harder than what it is. So. They're working on, on finishing it up today, the other half of it. They're out there right now with with, uh, with it. And so far, I've been, been very pleased with it. Uh, that's kind of what we've been working on the past couple of weeks. And uh, so we uh, hope to finish it up today or be real close to it. All we've got to do really after we get it all packed in today, get the, the it sprayed and everything packed in, all we've got to do today is uh, all we'll need to do then is is run the blade over it and smooth everything up. So it's it's looking real good so far. Okay. You got any seal coat plans in the next few weeks? If the other two guys that, that hadn't been able to do any, if they get through with some, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do some, uh, possibly. But uh, I hadn't. Uh, it's just according to what the weather does for us. I mean, if it starts cooling off, then that I may have to do some more of the ROC to to seal some of my roads off and, until I can do them, do some next year. All right, Dana. We got uh, was on 3250 uh, last week, and we uh, got about a mile and three quarter of it uh, tilled up, and uh, hadn't had to finish. We got to finish it, but we're about 85% uh, through with, uh, for right now until we get the seal on it. And then we've been uh, put some culverts in, about four culverts, and uh, been uh, side cutting the whole union of Liberty Hill communities. And uh, we're going to try to get some chip seal done next week, if all possible. What road? Uh, 3265 or 1820. 3920 and uh, there's another one, uh, 3350. And that'll utilize the new distributor for truck for that. All right. Something else, Brandon, I might throw in there. And, and I haven't talked to Al. I missed it to other two guys when they come in today. Uh, the guy that, one of my guys, John, that I've got running the, the distributor truck, he, he picked it up real good yesterday. He said he knew it real good this morning when we got back. He was a little worried about, about it when he got back, if he'd forget it overnight or whatever. And he said he thought that it would be good if we had one person to put on that truck and leave them on that truck and what, whatever precinct they're in. I don't have a problem with him doing that if the y'all agree to it and we'll have one person that runs the distributor truck whenever we run it, what, you know, whenever, whatever it is. Uh, and, and I don't mind releasing him I might at some point in time have to ask for one of you guys back or something or other if you know if, if you've got an extra man that I could get back for 
to replace him if we're doing something that, you know, we hadn't got everybody tied up with, with the whole thing. But that's, that's up to y'all. If, if y'all want to do it that way. I'd love to. Okay. Yes. Couldn't, Sounds good. Couldn't, couldn't pick a better, better man he, for the job. He, the guy went over it real well with him yesterday and how to clean it and all. He, he had that thing by the time we, he got through and we stayed over for another two hours after he got through spraying, he went back to the yard and by the time we got back to the yard, the truck looked basically like it did when we started yesterday morning, you know, and all, so. Uh, one, of, one of those guys from P2 said, if you spray that, a little diesel fuel on it before you start, yes. it'll come right off. That's what we did. and. Uh, uh, he, the only place that really you could see any yesterday when, when he got through with, with the pressure washer, and I think if we'd have brought it up to the maintenance shop and used that hot water instead of just the regular water out of our little pressure washer we've got, I think we could have blowed it off the, the mud flask, but there was still some on the mud flask, but I'm going to have him today when he finishes bring it to town and, and do it. So. Anything else good? No, sir, that's a good idea. Uh, on pitch. All right, we fixed a uh, driveway culvert on 1240 and we reworked a section of the road on 2715 and got it all packed down really good. I'm going to try to maybe put a seal on that to get, and then uh, chip seal a section that was real soft. Uh, Clean some ditches on 2710. We went and put three culverts on 2325 and we did a lot of drainage up and down that road. Uh, I'm still prepping that to get it ready to seal coat. We've been working uh, on 2670 and uh, had the bow mag out there and we're grinding the road up and packing it with water and the packer and getting it ready to put a sealer on it so we can have it ready to ch chip seal. And then uh, we cleaned out some ditches on uh, 2400. Uh, continue to mowing. Our mowings are going really good right now, and that's about it that I can remember off the top. I've been staying pretty busy getting ready to try to do some chip sealing. Uh, I was going to maybe try to do it next week. Me and Dana are really close to when we start, we're going to be tag teaming that, so it may be the following week. i got to see how long it's going to take me on 2670. It's probably going to be about two more days. Today and tomorrow, probably to have that road ready. And it's got to set a little bit and put a sealer on it. So I'll be ready to go some sooner or later somewhere, getting getting uh, 2715 ready to chip seal. So <clears throat> it's going to go good. All right. We have about uh, four miles ready to chip seal. Uh, and we are uh, just trying to <clears throat> get it and been patching roads and trees. And the normal everyday stuff uh, and get the schedule I think worked out between I think three and uh, and John all worked out but we're ready to help anytime anybody go to go we got four guys I could drive a truck but we got four for sure <laughs> we've been shuffling the equipment man everybody we just get out of a truck and somebody else gets in it and get off one thing somebody else gets on it it's, it's we get after it sometimes, some days. It's, <laughs> I can't we talk it. to everybody. <laughs> now, okay, so Al, what day, when are you hoping to chip seal this week or next week? Dana, we're Monday and Tuesday. That's right. And we got, we're planning on Wednesday and Thursday. Next week. Next week. Good. All right. We, uh, we couldn't, we had too many, every time we tried to plan something this week, it, something else we wanted to use a truck to do Jimmy's deal so but anyway I think that's that's our schedule right now for next week it's still hot enough isn't it oh yeah huh? oh yeah oh, plenty. yeah <laughs> that was a joke plenty and then John's supposed to be ready the next mm -hmm. after that Good. that's the plan <clears throat> all right thank you item number six let me give you an update on uh, some of you will recall being in meetings as long as a year ago with TxDOT and DPS. We met at the DPS offices. We've actually had a couple of meetings to discuss the westbound way station on the north side of Interstate 30. I don't bring you good news today, but let me tell you, uh, Commissioner Fitch and I went to uh, Atlanta, 
met with Mike Anderson and Deanne, and basically they've done some preliminary figures as to what it would take to expand and, and modernize that way station and bring it up to the kind of facility that DPS was originally asking us to do. And they've come up with an estimate of about $6 million. And that $6 million includes uh, the work that TxDOT would do, primarily lots of concrete, drainage preparation, pavement markings, illumination, uh, and then uh, a building that would possibly be built by us a canopy that would cover over the work area to inspect the trucks. All of that's included in this preliminary estimate. But the bottom line is DP, I mean, DPS, as much as they would like for Titus County and TxDOT to pay for this, TxDOT says, we're sorry to tell you that we don't have the money to do this and we're not even really sure we're the ones that should be paying for it. If the county's going to be the beneficiaries of additional fees and fines that are raised with um, with a project like this and with the ultimate expansion of that property they feel like we should pay for it so they don't have any money they don't anticipate getting any money they don't even really feel like they're motivated to find any additional money and I can kind of understand that but my position on this is uh, if we were to put that kind of money into that way station, we really have no control over how much that way station would get utilized, nor how much revenue it might generate. And so for the county to commit to anything more than our initial thoughts of a new building out there and a canopy, which might be in the half million to a million and a half dollar range, I'm afraid that we're on hold for right now. And I've shared this with DPS, and I guess they were kind of expecting something different. I think that they were expecting us to divert some of our funds on the college road to this project, but I don't believe we ever committed to doing that other than maybe delaying that project and using some, uh, and getting TxDOT to put funds that would otherwise go on the college road on into this way station. But uh, for one thing, we didn't have any idea how much money we were talking about. This preliminary estimate of $6 million is probably higher than I thought it would be, although $5 million was a dollar figure I had in my brain. So right now we've got some estimates, but we've got nobody who seems to be willing to pay for it. So I've kind of bounced it back to DPS to see if they might come up with some other idea or see if there's federal funding available. If the feds would feel like there was a reason to put a nice way station and inspection station here in the northeast corner of Texas for all the traffic that comes into our state, maybe the feds can come up with a way. But for right now, I think we can forget about uh, any expansion to our westbound way station. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Commissioner Fitch, did I cover that properly? Covered it pretty good. All they did was slide that bill across the table at us. <laughs> our eyes about popped out on us. And we just need, they, the first meeting it was maybe we could find funds and homeland security and such like that but now we can't find any so it's going to be on hold for sure all right item number seven is something we've done uh, annually for the last uh, three years and that is to consider and possibly approve the renewal of the workforce solutions northeast texas lease of our riddle street building in accordance with the lease terms and they are asking for a fourth option period. Just a brief history on that building uh, that we made available to uh, Texas Workforce Solutions or Workforce Solutions Northeast Texas. They got evicted, not evicted, that's not the right word. The owner of the property 
uh, out on West Ferguson came to an end back in early 2013. We provided emergency uh, lease of the Riddle Street building for them to move their operation in a mid-year 2013. We put them on a temporary lease of that building until we decided what we were going to do, until they decided where they might move their operation. And while they were temporarily leasing that property, we came up with the idea jointly to remodel that building and uh, make it suitable for their uh, operations. And we entered into a cost sharing agreement whereby we paid for the remodel and then we came up with a lease factor that would pay us back for those uh, modifications and expenses on that building. We entered into a long-term lease with them in March of 2014. That initial lease term was a three-year lease term, so it ended in March of 2017. So we have, uh, we have had an extension that went through 18 through March of 18 through March of 19 and our current lease ends or the current option period ends in March of next year March of 2020 and because we have verbiage in the contract that says they've got to give us plenty of notice and we've got to give them plenty of notice we're taking care of this in a timely fashion so that we can let them know if we are willing to continue to lease to them for a fourth option period uh, beginning next March of 2020. Each year the lease escalates by an amount that's tied to the uh, consumer price index for this period. We started off at a lease amount of $3,250 back in 2014. That monthly amount now is $3,489. We won't know what this new fourth option period lease amount is until the end of the year, which time we'll recalculate that based on adjustments to consumer price index. So the lease includes an option for them. They are saying, yes, we want to take advantage of that. We really don't want to deny that. We just simply want to approve that and assure them that, yes, they have that building for another year. Make that motion. Motion is made by Commissioner Parker and second by Commissioner Applewhite. All in favor of this fourth option period say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? He made the motion. He made the I'll motion. Second. They all sound alike. <laughs> the motion was made by Applewhite, the second was Parker. Aye. All right, and just as a reminder, we've had this discussion from time to time. Uh, that is a building that the county owns. It's producing some rental income, but it's always uh, there for your consideration should you ever decide that you wanted to sell that building and get out of that uh, piece of real estate. Moving on with real estate discussions, item number eight, consider and possibly approve hiring Richard Thomas, certified commercial real estate appraiser, to appraise the two non-county buildings behind the annex at a cost of $1,500 per appraisal with a two to three week turnaround. The buildings in question, uh, again, are between the annex and Guarantee Bank. One is owned by the uh, Spears estate, or the Spears and Thomas family. They are very interested in selling that building. The other building houses Clemens Insurance and the Fair Association, although it is owned by uh, Patty Clemens. So I, again, have talked to both of these. They both felt like starting off with an appraisal was a good point uh, to start. There's no assurance that we can get it bought for what that appraisal is. There's no guarantee that we'll want to pay that much for it. But we agreed at our last meeting to start off with an appraisal. I have checked around on who would be suitable appraisers. I've not got these names. This name did not come from either of those business owners. It's nobody that we have ever used. Mr. Thomas is out of Claremore, Oklahoma. He's done some commercial appraisal work for First Federal. 
uh, other names that I've gotten either did not respond or um, or indicated that they would be considerably higher than this. So I don't personally know Mr. Thomas. I am familiar with his work. Um, I didn't hire him, but he did an appraisal of one of my properties about five years ago at the request of one of the banks. I've seen his work. It's very professional looking. I thought his price here for each of these two buildings was very competitive. I would have anticipated about $2,500 for each of those buildings. But that will be a full-blown, uh, standardized appraisal with comparables, uh, with different approaches to value, such as replacement cost, uh, current cost, income approach, et cetera. And his turnaround was quite good in comparison to uh, other, other appraisals that I've had to go through. So Richard Thomas, Claremore, Oklahoma, total of $3,000 to appraise those two buildings, and he'll have us uh, an answer within three weeks. I'll make a motion we hire. Motion's made by Commissioner Riddle to hire Mr. Thomas. Second. Second by Commissioner Applewhite. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, thank you. <laughs> Item number nine. Uh, this is something that uh, I don't think any of you on the court have dealt with before, but and I just barely got in on the on the, on this uh, back right after I was elected and started in 2011. But every 10 years, of course, we go through uh, a census, and as part of that, we have to be sure that we are uh, looking at our population and where they are located and be sure that we uh, stay in compliance with the Voting Act. And Allison Bass has been providing this service at least, I know they did it 10 years ago because they did it for us and did an excellent job for us. We had some minor adjustments, I think, in Precinct 3 and 4, very slight adjustment that affected just a, a couple of hundred people. But once again, Allison Bass and McGee is providing their services on a first-come, first-served basis. They can't serve an unlimited number of counties, but if we will let them know something here quickly, we can get on their list. And they are offering to do the initial analysis related to election administration and compliance with the Voting Rights Act for a fixed cost of $5,000 based on the size of our county. Now, should there be a significant adjustments required in our boundary lines, whether it be for JPs or whether it be for commissioners, we will enter into future consideration of working with them, but that will not be until probably 2021. This is to do the initial analysis, uh, not that they would start immediately, but they would start uh, sometime next year. We just need to get on their list, and we will need to pay up front that $5,000 retainer, which again is a fixed cost uh, for this work. And we are comfortable working with Allison Bass. They do a good job. They did us a good job. All the commissioners were pleased when we did when we worked with them. Um, 10 years ago. So that is my recommendation that we utilize their services again. They've got this uh, process down uh, to an art and, and made it very easy for us. Make that motion. Motion is made by Commissioner Applewhite to enter into this contract with Allison Bass and McGee to provide redistricting analysis at a cost of $5,000. Second. Second by Commissioner Fitch. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Item 10 is uh, our time each year when we record, not approve, but we record the recommendation from the district uh, judges uh, regarding the auditor's office, uh, bailiff, and court reporter's salaries. And we need to enter this into the clerk's minutes. Carl, do you have anything that we need to sign or look at or anything no, like that? We just enter it into the minutes. The, uh, the district judges had their meetings a couple of weeks ago. 
those are the salaries that they provided and approved. So. Do we do we know what that is? Do we? We're not even approving those dollar amounts. We're just well, approving their actions. It's in the okay. order. All it's right, we do have papers. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. Let me tell you what we've got here. Whereas the official court reporter of the 76th Judicial District, Krista Lefevre, is presently drawing a salary of $65,044 per year and that is apportioned among the three counties of the district. Uh, whereas due to inflation, cost of living, and in order to confirm her salary to that official court reporters serving in similar populations and with a like workload, the court deems it necessary and appropriate that the salary should be increased by $108.41 per month or an annual increase of $1,301 and that will be apportioned each month between Camp Morris and Titus. Camp County would pay about 1,271, Morris about 1,326, and Titus County about $2,930. So that's related to the court reporter. That was the 76th district. Second item here is the 276th Judicial District. Uh, their court reporter is Linda Carroll, currently makes 65044, same amount, same recommendation as to increase of $108.41 per month. And the breakdown in the sharing will be between Camp, Marion, Morris, and Titus. Camp at 1,050. Marion at $940, Morris County at $1,106, and Titus County at $2,433. Those are per month figures. So that is the recommendation from the uh, judges regarding the 276th court reporter. The um, Next item here, it is hereby ordered that effective October 1, that the salary of the third assistant auditor of Titus County, Texas is hereby fixed at 30743 which shall be paid annually by the commissioner's court out of such funds as may be provided by law. This is not a shared situation. This is a Titus County only expense. The next item would be the second assistant auditor fixed salary at 39229 per year. Next item is the salary of the first assistant auditor fixed at $45,823. So those are the three positions there, uh, assistant positions in the auditor's office and the annual figures that will be paid by Titus County as determined by the district court judges. Lastly, we have the salary of the auditor, head auditor fixed at $61,000 per year, which will be paid annually by the commissioner's court. And again, that's, that finalizes all of these positions. You have two, excuse me, two court reporters, three assistant auditor positions, and then the head auditor, which will a change of persons in October 1. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. You're, you're bailiff, did you? Apparently, bailiff. apparently there's no, no, nothing that comes through to us regarding the bailiff. That's just how the item is, is worded. Do we ever make a decision on that bailiff's salary? Well, it's in the normal budget. Just in the normal budget. Budgeted through the sheriff's office. <coughs> There are no other positions that the judges are telling us to pay. Anything else would be up to us, is, I guess is the answer to your question. And we may have had it worded that way in the past when we were making a, a change uh, from how it had been done in the past. So probably that wording needs to come out of there since no decisions today affect anything having to do with the bailout. It must be in the budget then. I, I read where the bailiff makes X amount of dollars budgeted for the year. Yeah. Then for the part-time bailiff, they got him like at $25 an hour. 
Yeah. We've never had a part-time bailiff. I don't know. Yeah, guess. we did this last year. We had Woody over there. It makes more than a deputy. Well, that's what they pay. Twenty five dollars an hour. That's more than Tim's deputies make. Good position. Good position. He retired as a deputy and take that job. That's what I should do. Well, he doesn't get to work every hour. But, but we did put some more hours in there. But I also double check to make sure that bailiff is under their authority. So I'm not sure why you don't have a salary set by you. Well, if we do, then we'll need to get it. Is the bailiff paid for through sheriff's department? Yeah. Is he one of your employees, no. Tim? Well, I, he's, I have commission. Just commission only? <laughs> well, I pay for some, yeah, we pay for some of the security department. But well, you might check on that with, that with them, them, just see if that's something that we have to approve that they designate. But I know they've sent us orders so. this year about paying any certificate pay and some other money that they were directed to us by them. Okay. Well, that's all that they've given to us. That's all I'm asking for approval yeah. for today. If there's something else, we'll put it on the table. All right. So let the records indicate that we are recording the auditor's uh, office and court reporter salaries in the clerk's minutes. Does that require more signatures? No. Carl, you can give your salary for the last year. You can give your salary up. <laughs> so he's on a step program anyway. That's why I was saying if it was through Sheriff's Park, he get he gets a step. Maybe. Well, if we'll need to, if we need to do that, I'll need to get it on next Monday's or or two weeks from today. All right. Okay, we're down to item number eleven. Approve our oral and written reports.
Make a motion to approve the treasurer's report. Motion for approval is made by Commissioner Parker. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Applewhite. All in favor say aye. 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 Item 13, approve any budget amendments. We don't have any today. No budget amendments for this week. Item 14, sign pay orders, approve bill payments. Make a motion to pay our bill. Motion, Commissioner Parker. Second. Second, Commissioner Fitch. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, closing comments. I've uh, got a few items here. I want to read, uh, read something to you and explain why we're going to be having some tax rate hearings, a couple of them. We didn't anticipate that we were going to. I think that Carl has shared this information with all of you, but I just wanted to kind of put it uh, in writing, and if anybody wants a copy of this, that's fine. We'll go over this more in depth at our two tax rate hearings. On August the 26th, our last meeting, the court proposed a 2019 tax rate of 50.85 cents. That was a no change rate over the prior year. In other words, exact same rate, 50.85 as the previous year. That proposal passed three to two. At that time, I thought the rate was below both the effective rate and the rollback rate. We didn't want to go over the effective rate. We certainly didn't want to go over the rollback rate. However, subsequent to that proposal two weeks ago, four days later, in fact, we realized that the effective rate was lower than that proposed 50.85, which would have put us proposing a rate that was in excess of that effective rate. This scenario came about due to a couple of things, and I need you to understand both of these. Number one, the overall county property valuations increased significantly this year. We suffered a decade of declining values, primarily as a result of the power plant reduction. So an increase in our property values was out of the norm. This increase, however, was not readily apparent when we were putting these numbers together. When we compared the 2019 current year valuations with the 2018 prior year valuation, there actually appeared to be a slight overall decrease. We thought property values, despite all the people that you've heard talking about how much their taxes have gone up, we thought there was a slight overall decrease. That wasn't the case, though, because of item number two. That item number two is the Luminant Valuation lawsuit was settled late last fall, 2018, after the county property valuations and the 2018 county tax rate and budget had already been filed. That resulted in the settlement with Luminant that the appraisal district made resulted in a $187 million reduction to the 2018 tax base. In other words, the tax base that everybody worked off of last year got adjusted mid-year, late, late after everybody had already begun their new budget year. And so therefore, we had uh, a new benchmark as compared to the 2019. So we had a last year's total property value was this. In November, it gets knocked down 187 million. So when we're looking at our 2019 valuation in preparing our numbers, we were comparing to that same figure a year ago. We weren't comparing to that $187 million reduced figure. So instead of seeing a little bit of decrease, once that rate was adjusted mid-year, we actually had a property value increase, which makes more sense with everybody saying, how much their property values have gone up. So when we compare the 2019 property values to last year's values from our budget notes, we were using an incorrect baseline and missed the fact that there had been a significant increase in property values. Once we realized the error and compared 2019 values 
to the luminant settlement adjusted 2018 value, this produced an effective rate that was lower than last year's tax rate. And as you'll recall, in order to bring in the same amount of money, if property values go up, tax rate comes down. If property values go down, tax rate goes up to bring in the same amount of money. So when our values went up, we have to bring our tax rate down in order to maintain that effective rate. So because we don't want to exceed the effective rate or the rollback rate, we must adjust our proposed rate downward from 50.85 to 47.42. Because we are deviating from that proposed rate, we are now going to have two separate tax rate hearings. One will be this coming Thursday evening, the 12th at 6 p.m. That's this Thursday, three days from now, 6 p.m tax rate hearing number one. The second one will be next Monday, a week from yesterday, September 16th at 9 a.m. The good news in all of this is that we're going to be able to reduce the current rate by over three cents. I apologize for the error and the confusion. Perhaps this rate reduction will enable us to have a consensus vote when we vote on that tax rate. Now the bad news is that we're not going to be collecting that uh, additional maintenance and operation funds that we had planned on to use for the annex building project. So if we still decide that we want to move forward with that, in the future we may have to look at some other ways to pay for that. Um, we may have to borrow funds, who knows, we'll have to wait and see. But either way, taxpayers will see a reduction in the county rate down to 47.42, about three and a half cents less than last year, but we won't bring in that nice surplus to our maintenance and operation fund. So I'll read that again this Thursday and next Monday. Anybody have a question about that? I want you to be able to understand that and share this news with your constituents so that they understand that uh, we're not keeping it the same. We are going to be lowering it. All right, well, we can certainly discuss that more on Thursday if you like, but I wanted you to be prepared uh, and know what's coming down the pike and why we're having these tax rate hearings. We've got our annual flu shots scheduled this year. We're going to be doing them in the annex break room once again. Thurman's uh, Pharmacy will be providing those once again. We will do it Thursday, September 19th. That'll be a week from this Thursday. And that will be from 8.30 in the morning until 11 a.m. 8.30 to 11, Thursday the 19th at the Annex break room. Anybody that's covered by our insurance is eligible to get that shot. I think those were the only two items that I had read you that tax adjustment memo, tell you about the two tax rate hearings and the flu shots. I'll start on Commissioner Riddle's end. I don't have any. Commissioner Fitch? No, Commissioner Applewhite? Nothing. Quiet group. Jeff, the only other thing is not only are you going to have a tax hearing next Monday, but you have a budget hearing. Budget hearing, yeah. It'll be at the same time, same meeting. That's next Monday, six days from now, that'll be the second tax rate hearing and the one and only budget hearing. Right. Okay. All right, we have no comments from anyone else. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Make that motion. Motion is made by Commissioner Applewhite. Second. Second by Commissioner Parker. All in favor, say aye. 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 Yeah. All right, thanks everyone.